Welcome to the 2017 webinar series titled Advances in Allergy and Asthma, presented by the Allergy and Asthma Network. Our webinars are also brought to you by the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. This is Sally Schessler, the network's Director of Education. Thank you for joining us today. This webinar series is part of how Allergy and Asthma Network lives out our mission to end the needless death and suffering due to asthma, allergies, and related conditions through outreach, education, advocacy, and research. The goal of our webinar series is to share guidelines-based information and resources with you that are relevant to your life and your practice. It is my pleasure now to introduce Sue Lockwood to you. She is our Community Outreach Coordinator. Sue is a latex allergy expert and came to us from the American Latex Allergy Association. She is helping us expand our reach and effectiveness as we create and disseminate latex allergy information, advice, and resources for patients and healthcare professionals. Sue? Today's webinar is a part of the month-long recognition of latex allergy awareness and is titled Beyond the Gloves, the latest in latex allergy. We are pleased today to be joined by Dr. Michael Zachariasen. Dr. Zachariasen earned his MD at the Medical College of Wisconsin in 1988. He completed a residency in pediatrics at Children's Hospital of Wisconsin and fellowship training in allergy and clinical immunology at the Medical College of Wisconsin. For 17 years, he served on the full-time faculty of the Medical College of Wisconsin and was promoted to full professor. Published 35 peer-reviewed publications and 20 book chapters, as well as served as associate editor for the Annals of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. In 2017, he opened a private practice Family Allergy and Asthma Care of Montana in Bozeman, Montana. He joined the faculty of University of Colorado School of Medicine as clinical professor. He is board certified in allergy and immunology. Let's look and let's take a look beyond the gloves at latex allergy. And thanks for being here today. Dr. Zach. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sue, and thank you, Sally, for the introductions. It's a real pleasure to, to be with you, and thank you for taking the time out of your day to, to spend a few minutes here to talk about latex allergy. And again, we're going to go beyond the gloves, and I think that's a, an, uh, a good title because that's something we know a lot about. Let's look at some other, other things. But before I get started, I just want to say greetings from Montana. Uh, this this uh, picture actually was taken a couple weeks ago, and today there's no leaves on the trees. So the, the wind has taken care of that, but it's still a, a beautiful day. So um, let me start with some conflict of interest and disclosures. Uh, I do not have any conflicts of interest, but I do have some disclosures. I am a Green Bay Packers football fan. That's from living in Wisconsin. Uh, happily married. I have three adult children and no pets. Okay, so allergies, I think everybody's familiar with lots of different kind of allergies. And when I saw this cover of Newsweek, um, the, the, the cover is, is really looking to highlight the need for food allergies. So we have this, this young gal with a, a pint of milk in her left hand and a, probably a peanut butter sandwich in her right hand. But the question we ask in in this webinar is, well, what about this gas mask that she is wearing and then could she be exposing herself to latex? And, and let's not forget that latex is an important, important um, allergic uh, condition. So how I'm gonna kind of go through this today, um, we'll do a little background. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the gloves, but then we're gonna, really gonna focus on some more uncommon or unusual uh, um, sources of natural rubber latex exposure including some of the uh, food uh, reactions. Okay, if you're not already aware, latex, natural rubber latex comes from rubber trees. And these rubber trees are primarily in Southeast Asia. And on this, on this photograph, you can see these rubber trees with these uh, cut marks going at a diagonal 
uh, direction and that white um, sap coming from them, that is the natural rubber latex. From that, after that's collected, then it's processed um, into the latex products that we use today. So this is, uh, this is where it comes from. Um, uh, Thailand, Malaysia, very common places to have uh, latex rubber uh, farms. So what is in that, um, that sap, which is a protective mechanism for those trees? Well, there's lots of things. And many of these are proteins. There's at least 240 protein peptides. So peptides are small, small proteins. And of those, at least 15 of them have been identified as um, being significant um, allergen-inducing proteins. And they're, they're labeled HEV B1 through 15. And the HEV B comes from the genus species name of the rubber tree, Hevia brasiliensis. So they take the HEV and then put the B on there. So this is, uh, of those 15, this is just kind of a quick look at, well, how do they, how do they break out? Um, we know that there's different risk groups for latex allergy, and there are certain proteins that tend to be more of an issue uh, with certain uh, risk groups. For example, that have B1 and 3 proteins, those are the primary allergens in our patients with spina bifida, uh, which is a problem with their um, spine. The HEV B5, on the other hand, that is primarily the one as affecting healthcare workers and uh, cross reacts with kiwi. The HEV B6, uh, XR is cross reactive. So that's the cross reactive protein with banana and avocado. Whereas HEV B7 is the cross reactive one with potato and eggplant. And then the HEV B8 is cross reactive to pollens, kiwi, and avocado. Uh, the hard part right now, there's no easy way to um, identify or have a test that will tell us a particular patient has reactions to one of those individual peptides or allergens. So just um, for those of you who may be new to latex allergy, it's one of the really what we call recent um, um, allergic type processes. Um, venom reactions go back to the, uh, the pyramids. Um, asthma's been around for many, many, many um, uh, years, centuries, but really it wasn't until the, the late 1970s and early 1980s that latex allergy became a, truly a worldwide epidemic, and it was an ep epidemic that was very frightening. There was episodes of anaphylaxis in the emergency room, in the operating room, um, in doctor's offices, and dental offices. And, and also in many, many, many cases of occupational asthma. And it got the attention of allergists and it, it, it's kind of gone through this cycle of early recognition. And then really the, the outcome, um, although we're not completely out of latex allergy, of course, but it took a many, many hours of work between dedicated clinicians researchers, the manufacturing sec uh, sector, health policy, and even government cooperation to get to where we are today. And that is that latex allergy, thank goodness, uh, I hate to say almost eliminated, but almost. It is still a problem. It is still an issue. But uh, compared to other latex, uh, uh, I'm sorry, other allergic problems like cat and dog allergy and pollen, we've got a lot of information on, on this one. So to, to go back one step, the peak at the peak of latex allergy, it was estimated that about 17% of healthcare workers um, were sensitized and allergic to the powdered natural rubber latex. And really it was the powdered, it was the protein that was on the cornstarch powder that would become aerosolized, then inhaled. And that's how healthcare workers were primarily becoming sensitized, in addition to wearing rubber gloves and having it um, absorbed through their skin if their skin had any um, eczema or dermatitis. Well, what happened, a number of healthcare workers um, left practice. Um, 
leading it left to disability in, in many workers. So at the same time, the other high risk group were those patients with spina bifida and they're primarily um, children and infants. And at that point, 70% of all patients with spina bifida were sensitized or allergic to latex. Now, things are better. Um, so the average worldwide prevalence of latex allergy is believed to be around 4.3% for the general population. Um, and at the bottom of the slide, you see about 1% for the US population. Healthcare workers, it's um, about half as much, down to 9.7%. And then susceptible patients, 7.2%. So I think it shows that there's been progress, there's been recognition, there's been intervention. But the problem we, we have now are two things. One, there is a whole bunch of people who have continued persistent sensitization, those who are already allergic, and it's very challenging, if not difficult, to undo that. Then the other, other issue is new sensitization. And the hope here is that by identifying these at-risk groups, so again, patients with spina bifida, and you know that right when they're born, uh, atopic patients, those, were, those who are prone to developing allergy, asthma, eczema, and other groups that are exposed to repetitive glove use with natural rubber latex gloves. Those are the risk groups for, um, for developing new onset latex allergy today. And many of, this, many of these patients um, or potential patients may not be in the United States where uh, other, um, other protocols may not be being used. So let's now, this was, I just wanted to point out one of the kind of important things about gloves and really how we've made progress. So in January, just, just this year, again, latex allergy, if we go back to the 80s, it's been 37 years. Just this year, the FDA banned the use of powdered latex surgical gloves and examination gloves. So that was a long time coming. And what that means, when it means ban, at the bottom you can see that means a total prohibition on the current and future sales, distribution, and manufacturing of these gloves. So what is there to, to use? Well, the, again, this is where uh, industries develop a, a number of other latex-free alternatives, and that could be the nitrile or um, even for some, a non-powdered but still latex glove. Okay, so the latex products we're going to talk about, gloves. That was that was an important one because that was an early one. That was an I don't want to say an easy one, but it was easier to recognize than some of these other ones that that we may be dealing with. The fact that rubber products are used in so many um, commercial and consumer products that in varying amounts, tons of, of rubber latex is still used, and in many different areas and not just medical areas, obviously, but um, really across the board. So let's, we'll look at some of those. Um, and the, the challenging part is, is that at the end of the day, we may have a finished product um, and we are not necessarily sure if it has natural rubber latex proteins in it or not. Um, and trying to, to have good labeling and identification. Um, again, it remains one of our one of our challenges. But the routes for exposure to latex is also um, important. And I think if we think about the the skin, so things that directly touch our skin, that are absorbed through skin that is not normal, like skin that has eczema or dermatitis, allergens can be um, taken in through the skin, and you can be sensitized to that direction the respiratory, so breathing in particles of, of latex, and then mucous membrane. So this would be uh, gloves in the mouth or in, in other areas of mucous membranes. Okay, so to, because there are so many latex products out there, one of the questions is, well, how do we identify what's a risky one and what would be considered a lower risk one? So certainly I think it's been identified that the the dipped products of the natural rubber latex are definitely the high risk ones. And the reasons are, are, as noted here, low heat during manufacturing. So the way they're made, they're basically this 
liquid uh, a pool of latex and there's these, we'll use a glove for example, um, or a condom or a catheter, these um, uh, uh, porcelain forms are used, they're dipped into the, into the molten latex, they're, they come out, they're dried, and then they're pulled inside out, and there you have it. So that dipping process is a, a whole lot different than um, compression uh, process that's used for other latex products. So these are these are the risky ones: gloves, condoms, catheters, finger cots. Those are those little mini, mini things that go over your fingers. Latex clothing, latex balloons, um, and then at the bottom these multi-dose medication vials with a natural rubber latex stopper. Those actually aren't aren't necessarily dipped, um, but I included them here because it's involved in in a lot of medical. Um, um, issues. So, so this is kind of the good news. Most non-medical rubber products have a lot less protein allergen in them compared to um, the medical dipped products. So due to prolonged heating and then all these chemicals and solvents uh, that go into processing that natural rubber latex to make it into a really usable consumer product. The problem is what we don't have is we don't have a test that will tell us how, what is the latex allergen content in this specific, uh, this specific uh, product. Um, and when we don't know, that can certainly lead to, to questions and anxiety and, um, and, and trouble. So let's talk about some other um, uh, natural rubber latex products that are out there that some are, are very obvious. I think we'll start with the one on the right course, rubber duckies. It's right there in the name. And there are companies that are proud to continue to make natural rubber latex duckies. So sometimes it's right in the name. Other times you have to look a little bit harder. With the therapy bands um, that, we, that physical therapists and athletic trainers use, um, I'll get to that in the next slide. But again, um, you can see why we use these because they're very helpful for therapists. But uh, therapy bands can, um, some do contain natural rubber latex. In fact, here's the study. This was from, it was from a few years ago in 2008. And um, the researchers who did the study, they had a couple, it seems like a couple clinical observations of individuals who had a reaction to a latex sport band. So what they did, they took these sport bands, they took um, three different ones, and they processed these uh, bands looked at them from, from a protein content and tried to figure, well, which specific latex proteins are in here? And they found have B1, 3, 5, and 8. Um, so, and those are the ones that we know are allergenic uh, peptides or proteins uh, for patients. So I think um, the, the bottom line here is that if you are a physical therapist or an athletic trainer or you're a patient going to a physical therapist or athletic trainer and you have latex allergy, this would be an important conversation to have. Now, this was an interesting one, um, something that um, we should think about. So I'm not sure how many people out there are scuba divers, um, but there's said to be about 3 million scuba divers in the United States. Well, uh, apart from their suits, they they use these elastic rubber cords. It's kind of a, like a necklace that goes around um, where their um, mask is. And in this particular uh, is a case report. So from, from just this year, it, it identified this um, scuba diver who developed facial swelling as he was diving. And after going through with his... Um, uh, the, the history and the physical, they did the immunocap IgE for latex and it was positive and the cord was positive. So this was an otherwise healthy, so it was not a healthcare worker. It was not a patient with spina bifida, um, but it was um, just a, uh, a scuba diver and who developed new onset latex allergy. Now, I'd be remiss based on the time of year that we're doing this in late October that um, we have to be pretty careful around um, our costumes during the Halloween season. So here you see a picture of, a, of um, a mask. This is the least creepy one I could find to put on the, on the, on the PowerPoint, but 
many of these masks are made from natural rubber latex. So you got to be very careful about that. Other decorations, body suits uh, can be made from rubber latex and even this liquid latex that they use for special effects and uh, um, for Halloween or, or for other um, reasons can have uh, natural proteins in them. Now the next one I'd like to talk about is latex mattresses. So there's been kind of a, um, it seems a, a change from your inner spring mattress to a foam mattress to uh, air beds, not too many water beds anymore, but latex mattresses. And, and I put the, um, the website at the bottom of where I got some of this information, but I think even the people who are manufacturing latex mattresses are aware that there are people out there, patients who um, are concerned about are they going to have an allergic reaction if they sleep on a latex mattress? Or conversely, if you don't have latex allergies, could you develop latex allergy by sleeping on latex mattresses? So let's back up just a second. So how do you make a latex mattress? Well, they're made from blocks of latex. They go through multiple washings. They're vulcanized, which means they go through high heat. Uh, same thing that like uh, tires go through. And then the mattresses, they're wrapped in wool and then they're sealed in other covers. Um, in this particular one, they mentioned cotton. So there's, a, there's no direct um, uh, contact with the skin with these particular latex mattresses. But the question is, does any of this, does the latex ever come out of it? Well, um, in this particular study, it was published in actually 1999. So this, this information has been out there for quite some time. This group, they, they want to see, first of all, can we find latex allergy protein, latex protein in these mattresses? So, and they did. They found that HEV-B1 was still present in all four natural latex mattresses that were tested. And actually two of them had more protein per gram than latex gloves. So yes, it's in there. Um, the studies found, however, that the serum of only three out of 21, so this is not a big, big study, only 21 patients, three of those patients who were latex allergic showed an immune response um, when their proteins were mixed with, when their serum was mixed with the proteins of, um, that came from the mattresses. So again, they weren't sleeping on the mattress. They, they essentially did a, um, a blood test um, to show that, you know, you, you could potentially have reactivity. The second question is the more challenging one, and that is, is it possible to get latex allergies from mattresses simply by sleeping on one? And I think that probably the, the and again, I don't know the correct answer, but the most likely answer is probably not um, based on all, all the wrappings that go around it. But I think we have to keep in mind that, yeah, could it be a potential source? Who knows over, over time? Um, or if the wrappings deteriorate, could that lead to more exposure? That question is yet to be answered. Okay. Um, I wasn't sure whether I should put this one or not, but since it is Halloween, there are, there are costumes and there's a whole industry of wearing latex clothes. Sounds very uncomfortable. Um, but they're uh, particularly these body suits, uh, gloves, stockings, leotards, and then uh, gas masks. So again, this would be direct contact with latex that has been um, um, probably dipped uh, as opposed to uh, vulcanized and, and pressed. So I think we have to be very careful uh, about those. Now on this slide, what I have, I have on the left side, those items that contain natural rubber latex. And I think what's important is not only to identify what does have it, it in, but also what are some acceptable substitutes? What's, what can we consider safe? So certainly um, pacifiers and, and um, feeding nipples for babies, there are silicone substitutes. Similarly with craft supplies and masks, um, silicone should be safe, vinyl is safe. When it comes to um, undergarments and diapers, uh, the um, spandex and lycra is felt to be safe, but we just got to use caution, making sure we're, we're not being exposed to elastic webbing. Uh, mylar, the foil-type balloons, those are safe. Leather balls are safe. Staying away from uh, these other 
um, sports, uh, balloons, uh, soccer balls, volleyballs, etc., that are rubber. Um, uh, uh, foam rubber that is polyurethane, that's okay. Um, but if there's natural rubber backing on uh, carpets or mats, those need to be avoided. Uh, I think we've talked about condoms. There's obviously synthetic and natural membrane ones available. And from uh, bandages or uh, those uh, therapy uh, um, pieces, the first aid tape, there are brands that do not contain the natural rubber latex. Another, another step forward. This was 2014. So just a few years ago, the FDA recommended a change in language. So before that, uh, labels would say latex-free or does not contain latex. The problem with that is that those can be misleading because there was no way to prove that they were latex-free or that they didn't have any in there. So rather than use that language, the FDA said, let's change this around to make it more accurate and use language such as not made with natural rubber latex. So that's what we should be finding on um, consumer products uh, since 2014. All right, so the, this, um, these are tires actually from um, a mine, uh, a gold mine in Montana, non-working one, obviously, uh, but tires have been kind of an issue uh, because clearly many, many tires were made of natural rubber latex. Importantly now though, most auto and truck tire companies do not use the natural rubber latex. So they use synthetic butyl rubber. So even though they still have odors and they smell bad, um, they, they do not contain the protein, which is what triggers the, the latex allergy. So I think at least there's been a big change in that uh, because that's really hard to avoid. In fact, as, a, as an aside here, I saw a report, read a report uh, by Dr. Hamilton because a patient with spina bifida, a young patient was going to be on a playground where they had used old tires that had been shredded up to use as the playground um, matting. And so he, because he knows, because uh, he's an expert in latex allergy and had the laboratory to assess it, took those um, uh, old tires, natural rubber tires, well, no, not natural, those tire products, took them to the lab and um, assessed them uh, through protein analysis and there was no natural rubber latex found. So I think that can uh, help us as we're giving our advice to our, to our patients. So, so essentially these molded products like tires, for example, um, simply by the nature of how they're made, they are known to poorly release allergenic proteins if they're even made with natural rubber. Okay, let's, let's change gears just for a minute here. Let's talk about the fruits um, and, and vegetables and foods that are associated with latex allergy. First of all, it's pretty common. So 50%, so half of all latex allergic patients um, are believed to have a food allergy to at least one or more fruits, okay? Um, and over 25 different fruits have been identified. On the flip side, if you're allergic to um, uh, one of these fruits that's commonly associated with latex, about 10% of those patients will go on to develop latex allergy. So if, in other words, if you already have latex allergy, you got a really high risk of developing a fruit allergy. But even if you don't have latex allergy, but you're allergic to one of these, you still could go on to develop latex allergy. So these are the common ones you see at the uh, bottom, the banana and the kiwi and the avocado. And again, these are the high risk ones. I also, uh, chestnuts, the other one, I think that's just maybe eaten a little less common. Um, and that's not the water chestnut, that's just regular chestnut. Now, if you look at the moderate risk, um, apple, carrot, celery, papaya, raw potato. Remember those allergens that cross-react with potato? Um, as I mentioned earlier, there, that's, that would be there. Tomato and melon. So those are, those are moderate. And then there is a long, long list of other, there's 40 other, these are fruits and vegetables that um, have been associated with uh, latex allergy. And some of them seem, seem 
a bit unusual like tobacco um, or walnut. Now the one I highlighted here, jackfruit, I'm not, I've actually never never had a jackfruit. I really wasn't familiar with them until the, um, I was uh, alerted that somebody um, actually had anaphylactic reaction in our area after um, uh, touching and ingesting jackfruit. So this is a, um, um, this was a, a report from Thailand, and this was a healthcare worker. She developed latex allergy at work. Um, she was um, she had eaten 10 pieces of this dried jackfruit, and she had an anaphylactic reaction. So she saw her, uh, I'm assuming an allergist, and they did a skin test with this fresh jackfruit, and she had an anaphylactic reaction to the skin test. So um, she was extremely sensitive. So there's a picture of the jackfruit there. Uh, to give you an idea of, of size, I think those are nectarines on the right and um, another melon on the left. So they're big. They're, they're big. Now at the bottom, uh, this was the sign that was right next to the jackfruit. It says uh, product of Mexico, and then right below that it seems contains natural latex. So I think even the grocery store had identified that this um, could be an, an issue. So what are our needs? Um, I guess I've, I've made a lot of comments like we've come a long ways, we've done really well, there's less people that are sensitized, uh, we have more alternative products, but this is what we really need in, in my opinion. We need a, a reliable and a safe latex skin test extract. It's not available in the United States. So, and, and as far as making the diagnosis of latex allergy, because even our latex blood test is not 100%. In fact, it, it, it can miss latex allergy fairly frequently. So we need a better blood test. We need better skin test extract so that we can identify patients and, and either confirm or refute latex allergy. The other thing that I think would be just as helpful is have a reliable test to measure latex in products. So it's kind of like that test for nickel. There's this test where you can rub nick, uh, your ring on, um, um, on a test paper and it'll let you know is there nickel in it or not. We need something that can identify late, true natural rubber latex. And I think the other thing that would be helpful, and, and I, I'm not sure how any of this could be accomplished, but it would really be nice to know who is having latex reactions to what, um, like a registry. And I think an example I put up here was the Asthma Allergy Foundation. They have a food allergy res registry. Um, and, and I think those are really, they're hard to do, but I think there's a lot we don't know that people may be reacting to that maybe they, their primary doctor knows, their local allergist knows, but we don't necessarily have a database or a registry ongoing um, for, for latex allergy, uh, to my knowledge. So let me, um, let me summarize here. And again, I, I tried to leave plenty of time so we can get to some questions. Uh, but I think in summary, latex allergy is decreasing. So that is, that's the part of the success story that it took a lot of hard work from uh, a lot of uh, dedicated individuals and even cooperation from, from our government. But we know that dipped products are the high risk, molded products are the lower risk. We know that labeling should be better now. And just as in food allergy, label reading is, is really key. I think that we still have to be very concerned about latex fruit allergy syndrome. And even though I'd never seen a jackfruit until a few weeks ago, I think we need to all be attuned into what, what some of these risks are. And I think the other thing is we need to communicate these, these experiences uh, that patients are having to their allergists, to their physicians, so that we can get a better handle on truly what's happening um, out there in the community. I'd like to, I'd just like to thank, um, well, first of all, my mentors and uh, uh, latex allergy experts, Dr. Kevin Kelly, uh, and my other mentor, Dr. Jordan Fink, and certainly the Allergy and Asthma Network for giving me this opportunity to, to go over what I hope was some helpful and maybe insightful information, and also Sue Lockwood, who I've known for I think it's decades now, and <laughs> um, and uh, and her um, experience and knowledge is is as good as anybody's, and I appreciate that. 
Well, we appreciate you, Dr. Zach, and we're so glad you could be with us today. We have quite a few questions already for you. So here we go. What clinical trials are being performed in the United States regarding latex allergy? The, uh, The person says they know Italy was doing some, but couldn't find any in the United States. Yeah, that's a good question. I I was looking as well, and there was one in the United States. It was in Baltimore, Um, and what they were doing, they were looking at a particular glove called a Ulex glove specifically for use in spina bifida patients, and that one is, um, I believe that one is closed. The only other one I found was in Belgium, um, and that they completed that trial, and they were looking at... um, a powder-free latex allergy protocol in the operating room. So it was really designed more for um, hospitals and, and surgeons as opposed to our general public. So to my knowledge, I, I don't think I know of anyone that is currently ongoing. Oh, thank you. Well, you know, I as a nurse, uh, I remember back in my early nursing days, uh, everybody was using latex gloves. So I, you know, I'm aware of, of how widespread that use was. Okay, our second question is, why do some people become sensitized while others repeatedly are exposed the same way and do not? Oh, boy. Now, if I could answer this question, I'd probably <laughs> retire. This is, this is truly the million-dollar question, and I think it's these why questions that are the most challenging. We're not sure. You know, the experts are not sure. The, we're still asking that same question for why do people develop allergies to cats and dogs where other people don't? And why does it happen in two years versus 20 years later, or pollen for that matter? So I think even though we don't know the specific why, I think that the advantage we have in latex allergies is we know who's at higher risk. We know that when a child with spina bifida is born, to immediately go to a um, latex-safe medical uh, approach. But that why question, I'm, I'm still waiting to. Well, that's always good to know. Somehow that's a little reassuring. Uh, We have a patient who wrote in who said, I have a type 1 hypersensitivity to latex, causing me to not be able to breathe. My voice changes. I have a tight chest, et cetera. Would a filtered face mask work to keep me from breathing in the latex? And if so, do you have one you can recommend, please? Very good question. I think now that, so the powder that was on latex in latex gloves. Initially, it was talc. Then it was switched to cornstarch. That's where the problems began. So cornstarch powder carried latex protein. So now that powdered free gloves um, are the norm um, and the other ones are banned, we should be in better shape from that standpoint. On the other hand, it may be other um, consumer products that don't have that. So what what I think would be the, the most helpful would be they call it the N95 uh, face mask with respirator. It's been cleared by the FDA. They're single use, they're disposable, they're um, easy to find. Um, and, and why they call them N95, basically it means these masks block 95% of particles um, down to 0.3 microns. So 0.3 microns, to give you an idea of what, what that is. The human hair diameter is 100, 100 microns. So this is a third of one micron, so very, very tiny. Um, But the only people that don't do well with these are if you have facial hair or for children. But the N95, and I believe 3M is, is one of the makers of these masks. Thank you. That's great information. Okay, our next question. Are there any, you've touched on this before, but are there any advancements in finding a cure for latex allergy? Oh boy, allergy and cure are usually not used in the same sentence. So um, we can prevent, we can manage, we can ameliorate, but cure. So I would say the best cure is prevention. So um, if we can, it's kind of your primary cure. If we can prevent the, the, the sensitization in the first place, then we've got it made. Um, otherwise, the medications we use for uh, allergic reactions to latex are the same antihistamines and steroids that we use for uh, reactions to other allergies. But I will make a comment about allergy shots um, and sublingual 
uh, treatment. So allergy shots, you know, it's a very common treatment for allergists to administer allergy shots for people who are allergic to pollen and animal dander or venom. Um, and there were three trials of subcutaneous, so allergy shots, um, and two of the three actually showed some improvement. The problem was is that there was a very high risk of what they call unacceptable adverse events. So basically, people were having serious reactions while they were getting these allergy shots. So, so again, the, the, the pendulum swung. They said, well, let's try sublingual. So sublingual is where you put essentially drops or tablets under the tongue and see how that goes. Well, uh, I found that there were eight trials that were done. Six of them were randomized placebo controlled. So that's a very good, a good setup. One of them even included children. And all but one, so uh, five, I'm sorry, seven of the eight reported improvement in symptoms. Now, one of the problems is there was low numbers. So I think one trial only had like 30 patients in it. Um, and I think the other problem is they were not done in the United States. So uh, because we don't have an extract that we could give um, sublingual um, um, treatment to. So... Um, these were studies that were that were done. It was published actually in 2012, so uh, a, a compilation of these studies. So it's been five years, and I have not seen any studies um, since then in the last five years. Okay, great. We have another uh, question. When admitted to a hospital, does a person with a latex allergy need to be in a positive flow room, or is the average hospital room okay? I have a reaction in my respiratory system, unable to breathe. How safe is the average hospital room? That is a very good question. I try to keep people out of the hospital. <laughs> That's always um, a good thing. And I try to stay out of there myself. Um, but we realize, and I, I think the good news now is most hospitals have come to the conclusion that latex uh, allergy is important. Now, that took a while to get to that point, but I would say that um, it's, probably, it's probably pretty safe. Um, I don't know if a, if a, a, a special flow room would um, be necessary. It wouldn't hurt. That is, that is certainly true. Uh, I think the thing that I would do, because all hospitals are not the same, is contact that hospital, ask what their latex allergy protocol is. Um, and if they say, what are you talking about? Um, then, then there needs to be some education done. But I think over the years, uh, that I've, as I've been to different hospitals, that they've really advanced to the point that they, they don't want anybody in the hospital to have a reaction. Now, again, there may be unusual things that have small amounts of latex they have to be very careful in, but I think the biggest thing is not having powdered latex gloves, which then become airborne. Okay, here's our next question. People say they are airborne allergic to latex. Is this possible? Uh, well, latex that is on cornstarch or on powder, that's how, that's how most healthcare workers became sensitized uh, back in the 80s. So, yes. So, that powdered latex, that would be powder like cornstarch or other powders inside balloons um, or inside, again, you're not going to find it in surgical gloves. The FDA banned those. But uh, I would say balloons would probably be your your biggest risk on those um but just walking by um a uh, let's see walking walking past a desk that has rubber bands on it that it would be a very low risk i don't think there's going to be latex actually aerosolizing off of a, a molded product like that okay uh and someone asked uh if someone has a banana allergy should they be tested for latex allergy well, that's a good question. I think banana allergy is, I've certainly seen it. It's not, it's not uncommon, but it's definitely not common. It's not in the top eight for sure. But I think realizing that with banana, avocado, or kiwi allergy, that the risk is about 10%, I think the first thing to do is, is to identify, are there other risk factors there that would increase the risk of that person developing uh, uh, latex? 
allergies? So have they had reactions to vaccines? Have they had reactions at the dentist? Have they had, um, do they have spina bifida? Are they healthcare workers? Do they have repetitive glove use? And if any of those are, are, are affirmative to those answers or those questions, then I think it can't hurt to check. The problem is our test isn't that good. So you can do the blood test, but I think the most important test is sitting down with your doctor and going through all your other allergy symptoms that you may be experiencing to see if, if you should um, um, be more, uh, have more avoidance uh, measures in your, in your daily activities to avoid latex. So basically what I'm hearing you say is that if somebody's questioning if they have a latex allergy, it would be a very good idea for them to keep a symptom diary so that they could discuss that with their doctor. Is that correct? Exactly. So you summarized it just perfect for me. Yes. Well, there you go. Yeah, so. <laughs> oh, our next question is, is there a successful desensitization process? Uh, well, those clinical trials did show that there was successful desensitization, yes, um, in that um, sublingual um, manner. The, the, the problem is that it's not done in the United States, um, and because we don't have the, uh, the product, the, uh, really the extract to do those desensitizations. So theoretically, yes, and not even theoretically, it has been done. Um, the challenging part is, is it's not available in the United States. Okay. Uh, someone's asking a question about vaccines. They said, my hope is that latex will stop being used in vaccines since this exposure can escalate the allergy to anaphylaxis. People get exposed without their knowledge to a known allergen. So can you talk to, to us about, you know, what, what is good guidance for people who uh, have a latex allergy but, uh, but uh, obviously there are vaccines out there that are very beneficial. Right, and I think vaccines can come in different manners. So really it's not the vaccine itself, it's if the vaccine is in a vial that has a natural rubber latex stopper, then there's the, the potential for that vaccine to be contaminated, if you will, with uh, latex proteins from the stopper either because they kind of leach in there or in a multi-dose vial where a needle's puncturing that stopper over and over and over and over, that can, uh, there's been studies that show that that can increase the amount of um, uh, latex in that vial. So I think that, of course, the first thing is if, you, if there is a vial that does not have a latex stopper, and there's more and more of those, so they're using synthetic, or if it's a glass ampule where there's no um, stopper at all, those would be our first first choice. Uh, if the the second option would be if that's if that's not an option, then the next step would be to it's called this um, the single puncture or the one stick rule, and and that basically means you know use a vial that has not been punctured by a needle before, so less likely to find um, protein there. And the other option that some associations have advocated uh, would be just to pop the top. In other words, instead of putting a needle through that stopper, just take the top off and draw out what you need and then replace the stopper. And of course, that could potentially lead to contamination and, and other issues. So there's no one perfect solution. I think these are, these are called like precautionary measures. Uh, and I think what we do is we, we tend to weigh the risks and the benefits. And if those benefits of those vaccines outweigh the risks, there were the potential risks of a reaction to latex, then we go forward. Um, and certainly if there's a high risk of having a reaction and the benefit of a, a particular vaccine is so minimal, then that it's felt that the risks are greater than the benefits, then you may opt to go the other direction. But that, that becomes a very personal decision uh, between the patient and their doctor rather than kind of a widespread uh, recommendation. Okay, next is a comment that's really quite fascinating. Someone wrote and said they're listening from the United Kingdom and they said, thank you. They were a police officer, medically retired from a latex allergy. So any information that we provide the public is wonderful so that others can understand. They said they really appreciate this and thank you everyone. That's pretty exciting. 
Okay, here's our next question. Powdered latex gloves are frequently used in the food in industry. Is there any move to reduce this? Well, that is a good question. Um, so there, there are in some states. So uh, food regulations, uh, when I went in to look at what food handlers and restaurants do for food regulations, I have never seen so many regulations in my life. And again, I think that the goal is to protect the public, provide good hygiene and sanitary food, that type of thing. But at this point, and now my data is from the 2013, they call the food code from the FDA and their food regulation. They did not ban um, latex gloves. Um, they basically gave caution statements. Um, and, but there is a state by state uh, difference here. So there's a few states that have chosen their regulations to allow only non-latex gloves for food handling. And that would be Arizona, Oregon, and Rhode Island. And then six other states have a less, you know, less stringent recommendations. They say do not use latex gloves for food handling or post a notice that says latex gloves are in use. And those, those six states are, uh, let's see, Washington, Kansas, Michigan, Massachusetts, New York, and good old Wisconsin. So I think um, even though the FDA at the federal level hasn't made rules, certainly rules can be made at the state level. And I think that's where it takes um, uh, time and effort uh, to, to move those along the road. Well, here's a question I had not thought of. Did, where are we at with airbags and vehicles? Is there a high risk for exposure when one is deployed? That is a good question, Sue. I, you know, I, I, I'm not sure. I do not know the answer to that. I would have to look that up and see what... Um, I, I do know that there have been allergic reactions to the powder that's in airbags, but that um, is completely unrelated to latex. So uh, respiratory conditions from airbag that have broken open um, can happen, but at least the ones that I'm familiar with, it, it did not turn out to be a latex issue, but I'll have to go double check that one. Okay. Um, I, I want to just remind our listeners, uh, if you listen to this webinar live, you can print out a certificate of attendance. Uh, so if you have not done that yet, please go on your go to meeting, go to webinar control panel, look at the for the handouts, and there's the certificate of attendance. Please print that out at this time. As soon as the webinar is over in just a few minutes, that will no longer be available. So please go there, download and print that at this time. And here's our last question. Uh, my son was born with a latex allergy. He does not have spina bifida. As he gets older, he is only seven. Will his latex allergy get worse? Is there a website for me to use as a reference for help? Mm. That, is, that, is, that is a really good question. I, we know that sometimes over time allergies can worsen, especially if there's ongoing exposure. And uh, the flip side, sometimes allergies over time will resolve, including food allergies and um, penicillin allergy, medication allergies. So I don't know if we can actually predict the course, except to say that if there is ongoing ex intermittent exposures or the previous reactions have been severe, then it's less likely to outgrow that. Um, I think from the standpoint of the best places to look for information for this would be right here at the um, Allergy and Asthma Network. And I think that's where you're going to find the up-to-date information as it's, as it's made available. We, we do on our education page, we do have a latex allergy toolbox where you can find a lot of useful information. Well, thank you so much today, Dr. Zach. We totally appreciate the time you took with us and your, your willingness to stay and answer questions. I think a lot of great information has been shared today. I'd like to encourage our listeners to register for our November webinar. That will be on November 16th at 3 p.m. Eastern when Dr. Bradley Chips and our president and CEO, Tanya Winders, will be sharing information on severe and 
asthma, titled The Asthma Yardstick, What It Means to Practitioners and Patients. You can register for this webinar on our website at allergyasthmanetwork.org. Look for education in the horizontal navigation bar near the top of the page and scroll to webinars. You can also view our archived webinars on this page on our website. Allergy and Asthma Network is offering a new resource to you, a three to five minute video post of our popular Ask the Allergist series. On our website, under News and Views, click on Ask the Allergist. Last month's question was on stepping down asthma medication, and we re release a new post each month. Visit our website for quality guidelines-based resources on allergy and asthma. Also, access important medical information on allergies and asthma from our partners, the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at allergyandasthmarelief.org. Thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to having you register to be with us next time on Advances in Allergy and Asthma. This is Sally Schessler for Sue Lockwood and the staff at Allergy and Asthma Network. We wish you a great and healthy day as we work to breathe better together. <laughs>